John Bonet Ramsey. She was strangled with a cord. Little Miss Colorado. Six-year-old murder victim John Bonet Ramsey. Unknown intruder. Her brother. John Bonet Ramsey. Oh they still have not interviewed the parents. John Ramsey didn't do it, and he didn't have a clue of anybody who did it. My life has been hell from that day forward, and I want nothing more than to find out who was responsible for this. After John Ramsey and Fleet White found John Bonet's body in the wine cellar located in the basement, John, in a hurry, ran up the stairs, taking the body with him, placing the body on the floor of the kitchen. Detective Linda Arndt then moves the body to the living room. Then Arndt orders Fleet White to stand by the door to the basement and guard the door. Fleet White goes to the door but for some reason runs downstairs to retrieve the duct tape from the basement floor. This is all taking place between 1.04 p.m. and 1.23 p.m. At approximately 1.30 p.m., Priscilla White calls her home. I'm guessing here, Captain, but this is very likely to halt Burke leaving the White's house and returning to the Ramseys. Around this same time, officers Ron Walker and Larry Mason return to the scene saw John Bonet's body, and then searched the home, afterward securing the house. Shortly after the body was found, John Andrew Ramsey, Melinda Ramsey, and Stuart Long arrive at the Ramsey house in Boulder, Colorado. Between 1.30 and 2 p.m., a detective overhears John on the phone. John called a pilot, his pilot, telling him to ready the plane. This, to me, is very strange behavior from somebody who has just recovered the body of their six-year-old daughter. Right. Around 2 p.m., John Ramsey signs a consent form to search the Ramsey home. Now, just touching on that that plane call to the pilot for a little bit here, the the detectives had to stop John Ramsey from leaving, the, the Ramsey family from leaving, telling the Ramseys, hey, you shouldn't go anywhere. We have a murder investigation. The crime scene's your home. And, you know, they're not going to tell them this up front and center here, but obviously they're suspects. Right. And I, I think the way the Ramseys were actually thinking was Atlanta, Georgia was what they considered a home. So we have this bad thing that happened. We want to get back home. We don't want to be here. We don't want to be in this house. Um, but that does, like you said, hinder the investigation. I don't think that hinders the investigation of the house or the crime scene, but it hinders the investigation and being able to talk with them um, adequately. Yeah, and then regarding this consent to search form for the, the search warrant, if you will. Or yeah, because this consent. makes it seem like John's being very cooperative. Yeah, I, and I technically don't believe this to be an actual search warrant, you know, one that you bring before a judge, judge signs off on it. I believe this is just a consent to search form signed by John Ramsey, the, right. the owner of the home. This is just one of those other little details within this case that I absolutely cannot stand is that Regardless, you know, depending on whose magnifying glass you look at these details from, you get a different story mm-hmm. on what's going on here. Where the Ramsey defenders would tell you, look, this is proof positive that they were extremely cooperative. Don't bother Nick with worrying about that they wanted to hop on a plane and fly far away. Because this shows how cooperative they are. They were signing a consent to search their home form. They have nothing to hide. They're an open book. But then the ones that want to come after the Ramseys point out they're not really an open book because John later says that he thought he was signing off on uh, on on saying that, yes, you can perform an autopsy on the body. Right. So 
it's it's just frustrating. That's one of the most frustrating pieces of this case. Well, I think the one of the frustrating things is when people say only one thing's the truth, right? Can we agree on that? It, it can't be both. Yeah, well, I th- well, I don't know. I, I think what well, they say there's three sides to the truth. There's yours, mine, and the actual truth. Not always. Um, but Sometimes I think there's just the truth. But I think with the whole wanting to go back home, he didn't go back home. <laughs> like they right. wanted to. The cops said, yeah, don't do that. That's a bad idea. But it's so stupid with this case. It's like a non-point. Like, yeah, he was like, let's go back home. Hey, don't do that. Okay, we're not going back home. But they didn't They didn't stay in the house. They, nobody wanted to be in that house. Oh, and I, ca- I cannot blame them. I And I don't even know if John ever went back in that house after that day because they ended up staying with their friends. But But let's also be clear that Around this time, they pulled John into a room by himself, and they talked to him for a while. Mm -hmm. And at some point, they talked to Burke by himself for a while. So They do talk to Burke. This would be at um, the—he never comes back to the Ramsey's house. Right. So they talk to Burke one-on-one. My understanding is it was straight up one-on-one. It was—Burke was still at the friend's house. Right. And he's over there, you know, playing with the other kids and they're distracting him. The, I, that's a troubling aspect to this case, too, because you can look at just that whole situation in two different ways. One, are you protecting your child, Burke, by removing him from the situation that could scar him for life, something extremely traumatizing? Or are you purposely putting him away so that he doesn't disclose some information Right, but you you eventually let him talk to the cops one on one. John's not even in the room with him. Right. So if you're so worried about what he's going to say, or if if you knew that he just smashed his six year old sister's head with a flashlight, you're going to let him sit in a room with a detective by himself, or with friends and others that he could share that information with willy dilly i mean he's nine years old right you're not there when when they ship him off and also that's not just the ramsey's thought process of oh let's get burke out of here this was a this was the cops and the ramsey's going he needs to be removed from this site the cops suggested that he should be removed from the the ramsey home no i think it was it was like a a collective effort it was a collective idea i don't think it was just as simple as the Ramsey saying, hey, he needs to get out of here. One thing I will point out here that I think is very troubling on behalf of the Boulder police and on the Ramseys is if you're working under the scenario that a child has been kidnapped from your home and a ransom has been called for in a letter, right? wouldn't you want to protect your, your remaining child? Wouldn't you feel that that there should be some kind of security for this other child rather than sending him off to some friend's house? Right. Know, it, just seems, I, it seems it it's another situation where we can point out that the Boulder police clearly did not know how to respond to a kidnapping situation that where a ransom is being called for. Yeah, but at the end of the day, I think people that are pointing at the Ramseys constantly, you don't know what it would be like to lose a six-year-old daughter or how you'd react or what you'd be thinking about. I think it'd be hard to think about anything. And you go, oh, well, they shipped him away, so they're not protecting their son. Well, they might not even be able to, to think properly. So I think some of their actions... Right. That, and that's what I mean. That's when the Boulder police should have stepped in and said, no, this is this, this home right now is secured because we have law enforcement presence here. He's safe here. Right. I I agree. And they should have done a better job of trying to, when they got to the scene initially, they should have cleared the whole house and the, and then they would have found her. And then the crime scene would have been contaminated. And they also would have had enough officers where you're not having her, father pick her up and contaminate evidence and and then have the mother cry over her and contaminate evidence have the detective pick up the victim right and contaminate evidence i mean it's 
that's pretty odd. Well, not only did Linda Arndt move the body after John moved the body, mm-hmm. and this is important to the autopsy, but so she allowed someone to take a blanket as, you know, a sign of, uh, to protect their child or I don't know, remorse or whatever, whatever, however many different ways you want to look at it. Right. She allowed someone to take a blanket and place it over the body once it was removed to the moved to the living room. Yeah. And then to further that, John Bonet's feet were still sticking out from the blanket, from the bottom of the blanket. And I believe Linda Arndt told someone to cover up the feet as well. So they took a Colorado avalanche, you know, the hockey team. They either took a hockey sweater or a, or a sweatshirt and placed it over the feet of the body. So what that means to the layperson, basically any hairs, fibers, anything like that, that could have been on that blanket could have been on that sweatshirt or sweater now is on, could be on her body and or clothing. Yeah. So it's just, it's just truly a mess. Now, shortly after John signs this consent to search form, the Ramseys leave their home. They go to stay with the Fernies. Remember, we discussed the Fernies. They showed up early that morning to the Ramsey home. Yeah. This, uh, the Ramseys going to the Fernies includes John's older children, John Andrew Ramsey and Melinda Ramsey and her boyfriend as well. Now, sometime that afternoon, John Ramsey calls and requests a visit from Michael Bynum, who is reported to be John Ramsey's close friend and a corporate attorney. It is during this visit, so Michael Bynum, he agrees to this visit, and it's during this visit, that same afternoon, that John hires Michael Bynum to represent him And Mr. Bynum advises the Ramseys at that time that they need to get additional attorneys. Right. But you're, I think you're missing one step. He actually got a call. Their lawyer got a call. He wasn't hired at the time, but but that's why he suggested that John gets a lawyer because he got a call from a contact that he had inside the police department that said, they're just trying to make this about you guys. And that's it. And, and that's when he suggested you need to get a lawyer on December 26th, 1996 at the home of John and Patsy Ramsey. This is from the report. These are the words of pathologist, John E. Meyer, MD. He says the body of this six year old female was first seen by me after I was called to an address identified as 755 15th street in Boulder, Colorado. I arrived at the scene approximately 8 PM and entered the house where the decedent's body was located at approximately 8.20 p.m. I initially viewed the body in the living room of the house. The decedent was lying on her back on the floor, covered by a blanket and a Colorado Avalanche sweatshirt. On removing these two items from the top of the body, the decedent was found to be lying on her back with her arms extended up over her head. The head was turned to the right. A brief examination of the body disclosed a ligature, around the neck, and a ligature around the right wrist. Also noted was a small area of abrasion or contusion below the right ear on the lateral aspect of the right cheek. A prominent dried abrasion was present on the lower left neck. After examining the body, I left the residence at approximately 8.30 p.m. At 10.45 p.m. on December 26th, the body of six-year-old John Benet Ramsey is removed from the family's home. Before we move on to December 27th, Captain, I want to make sure that I point out here in regards to contamination of the body, that it has been noted by several people. This is not one of these items that's in dispute or up for debate. This is across the board. John Ramsey, Patricia Ramsey, Linda Arndt, and Fleet White all touched the body before it was examined. Right. And John Ramsey and Patricia Ramsey touched the body several times. I'm not pointing that out to indicate guilt or to indicate that the Ramseys were trying to cover something up. I think it would be a 100% natural reaction to want to go to your child, to touch your child. I'm just pointing it out for the, the purpose of 
evidentiary value. Yeah, I mean, it compromises the scene. We're not saying that it's to cover up anything. It compromises the scene. And um, and then we also know where we're starting from. So the following is from Steve Thomas's book. This is inside the Ramsey murder investigation. Steve Thomas was one of the leading detectives on the case. This is from page 41. And it says, It was the morning of December 27th. The little body was first removed from a locked yellow outer covering, then from an inner black bag. The paper sacks were removed from the hands and feet, and Meyer, remember he is the pathologist, began describing his findings. The victim weighed 45 pounds, was 3 feet 11 inches tall, and had green eyes, and some green garland was caught in her blonde hair. A single loop of white cord was around her right wrist, tied on top of the sleeve, but so loosely the doctor easily slid it free. There were 15 half inches between that loop and a loop on the other end, which once apparently had bound the left wrist. A white cord of the same type was wrapped so tightly around the throat and neck that a deep horizontal furrow had been dug into the skin. A gold chain and cross were tangled in that ligature, which was tied behind the neck to a broken stick. Blonde hair was snared in the knot, and the coroner had to cut the hair in order to remove the cord, which was tied more like a noose than a twisting garrote. The broken paintbrush used as the garrote handle had Korea printed on it. When Meyer clipped the nails of each finger, no blood or tissue was found that would indicate a struggle. He used the same clippers for all the fingers, although doing so created an issue of cross-contamination. For optimal DNA purposes, separate and sterile clippers should have been used for each finger. Furthermore, we later learned that the coroner's office sometimes used the same clippers on different autopsy subjects. Oh, that's, that's amazing. Great job there. Captain, we could go through the entire autopsy. Uh, I want to kind of go through and cherry pick some items, but to do the entire autopsy would be an exhausting process. It's over 3,000 words Mm -hmm. long. So I point that out, one, to not be lazy about it, but to point out that it was and appears to be a thorough document constructed by pathologist Meyer. Mm Mm-hmm. Cherry picking some items here at the top of the report, Captain. We have name Ramsey well, well, Jonbenet. I just want to say real quickly, if if you're not willing to take the time to have different clippers on each finger, I would assume there's some kind of protocol. Let's just if we're going to start with that conversation, then and yes, it's three thousand words. I don't know if that means it's thorough. I just meant the document. I said it was a thorough document, Mm -hmm. not a thorough examination. The thing here with these autopsies that gets difficult is you're solely relying usually on one individual to handle this process properly. As you're pointing out here, follow protocol. And protocol varies depending on what county you're in, what city you're in, what state you're in. Mm -hmm. It's I hate to say this, but it truly is a bit of a willy nilly process. It's one of those situations where you question the science of it because it's human error and it's, and it can be laziness. It can be a number of different things. Yeah. And it can be opinion based. Correct. And the other thing too is, you know, I I had a discussion once with, with some people and they said, well, there were multiple hairs found on the body from different sources. And that means that there were multiple killers. And I said, well, not necessarily. We've done enough of these cases to realize that, that random hairs and fibers can end up on people for a number of different reasons that are innocent in nature. Right. But to further that along in the way that the way that I connect this to this conversation is I've reviewed at least two cases where later we learned that one of the hairs found on the body came from the body bag that the body was placed into and it wasn't cleaned properly. Right. Or it was a county that was quite poor and they're just reusing body bags all the time. The report states at the top, 
The name of the decedent is Ramsey John Bonet, date of birth August 6, 1990, age 6, uh, sex female, autopsy number 96A155. Death date and time, December 26, 1996, 1323. So 123 p.m. This is interesting. They have to, well, I guess they don't have to, but per protocol are supposed to put a time of death on this form, whether they come up with an actual time of death or not. And in this situation, 123 p.m. is put on this document because that's considered to be the agreed upon time that the body was in the living room. Mm -hmm. We know she didn't die at 1.23 p.m. And in fact, there was no real time of death that was truly established in this case. Steve Thomas says that the detectives were told to work with a window of 1 a.m. to 7 a.m. And then he kind of backs into that a little bit and shrinks that window based off of some information we know to be true, the 911 call comes in before 6 a.m., so you can go ahead and take away 6 to 7. Now you're left with 1 a.m. to 6 a.m. Right. I like that, and I do like... You're going to hear me question Steve Thomas's actions and, and theories and, and how he came up with some stuff as we move forward, but I want to point out that Personally, I find his investigation to be interesting in in a sense that there are pieces of it that seem incredibly thorough, where even on the timeline of the day when the body's found, he has multiple times for when people arrive to the house inside his report and inside his notes. Some people point out, what a terrible job. This detective has multiple times for the same people arriving to the house. It, this can't be an accurate document. Right. Steve Thomas never claims for that to be an accurate document. What he's saying is, I've talked to everybody. Somebody tells me person A arrives at this time, and then somebody else tells me person A arrived at that time. Until I can prove what time that person arrived, I'm leaving both in my report and in my notes. Both are correct. So I, I find that portion to be well done on, on Mr. Thomas's behalf. Yeah, because like you said, I mean, he's not just going, okay, well, I talked to this person, I talked to this person, and I believe this person more. Right. He's just saying, He's no. leaving it on there right. until he can prove other, uh, otherwise. Yeah. And where I find it a little tricky, though, is when we have the time of death, when he's discussing what he believes or what he claims the detectives believe to be the time of death, uh -huh. I find that I his theory and the detective's theory kind of wiggle that theory gets wiggled into their time of death in the window that they create. You know, they're making assumptions that I think are very dangerous to make in this investigation. Uh -huh. One being that they say, okay, well, we're told to work with this window of 1 a.m. to 7 a.m. We know that it was before 6 a.m. because of the 911 call. We've shrunk the window a little bit. They, they want to shrink this window. And I, I, we need that window to be much smaller than that. We need that window to be shrunken. Yes. So we can f really get an idea of what happened and who needs to be accounted for during that time. The thing that I believe that they do that's dangerous to the investigation is they make the assumption that the, the ransom letter was penned after the death and that the letter writing process would take a certain amount of time right. and thus they can shrink the window even more. Have you wrote the letter out yourself? I have not, but if I sit down and try to write it with my left hand instead of my right, it's going to take me even longer. Right. But I mean, do you have like just a guess of how long do you think it would take you to copy? Well, you say copy, but there's a chance that the author was, was writing it from, you know, scratch, right? Yeah. yeah that they're coming up with it. And here's the other thing. How many times did they, how many practice letters could there be? You know, there are multiple pages ripped out from that pad of paper. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe it's three that they were able to determine that there were three pieces of paper missing between where they believe the, the page one of the letter came from and the rough draft, let's call it, with the Mrs. and Mrs. or uh, Mr. and Mrs. I at the top of the page. Right. But what I think 
people should do is pull out a couple sheets of paper and copy it. Start by copying it. That gives you some kind of time frame. It's, that's under five minutes. So, yes, it's it's a lot different to create one from scratch. But if the perpetrator brought that note with them, under five minutes to copy it. Yeah, over eight hours if you have to sit down and watch Ransom, Dirty Harry, and Speed. Mm-hmm. <laughs> When you're yeah. doing, conducting it's amazing your, that they didn't find those tapes at the scene of the crime. Right, a uh, you're right, a portable. Remember those old TV VCR combos? Yeah, black and white. Yeah, that the, <laughs> the perp brought it with them. All right, sorry, we're we're getting getting off track here. Uh, final diagnosis: tox studies, blood ethanol, none detected. Blood drug screen, no drugs detected. Final diagnosis. Cause of death of this six-year-old female is asphyxia by strangulation associated with craniocerebral trauma. Cheers to you, Captain. I'm raising a big, big glass of Christmas Bomb 2019 by the awesome folks at Prairie Artisan Ales Garage Grade. Four out of five bottle caps. Thanks to everyone who has donated to the beer fund. And I don't mean just this week. I mean all year long. Yeah, for the last however many years. You keep the lights on and you keep beer in the fridge. Well, in our mouths as well. Picking up where we left off here, Captain... To put it quite frankly, Mm -hmm. just to muddy the waters even more in this case, we have basically two causes of death declared by Mr. Myers, MD, a term that we will probably be discussing quite a bit. I want to describe this to everyone just so we're all on the same page as we move forward. The term will be garrot. The general consensus being here that a garrot can be made out of many different materials, including ropes, cable ties, fishing lines, nylon, guitar strings, telephone cord, or piano wire, anything of that type of nature. A stick may be used to tighten the garrot. This is a Spanish word, which actually refers to the stick itself. In Spanish, the term may also refer to a rope and stick used to constrict a limb. This basically is a popular murder weapon, and for sadists, it's a torture device. It's, unfortunately, a term that we've used many times on this show. Continuing with our exam here, Captain, the decedent is clothed in a long-sleeved, white-knit, colorless shirt. The chest area contains an embroidered silver star with silver sequins. Tied loosely around the right wrist, Overlying the sleeve of the shirt is a white cord. At the knot, there is one tail end, which measures 5.5 inches in length with a frayed end. The other tail of the knot measures 15.5 inches in length and ends in a double loop knot. This end of the cord is also frayed. There are no defects noted in the shirt, but the upper right sleeve is contains a dried brown stain, 2.5 by 1.5 inches, believed to be from the nose or mouth. There are long white underwear with an elastic waistband containing a red and blue stripe. The long underwear are urine stained over the crotch area and legs. Beneath the long underwear are white panties with printed rosebuds and the word Wednesday on the elastic waistband. The underwear is urine stained and the inner aspect of the crotch are several red areas of staining measuring up to 0.5 inches maximum dimension. To touch on this, what we've just reviewed here, Captain, the in regards to the urine, this is a big, big thing in this case because what we would learn very early in the investigation from the Ramsey's housekeeper is that John Bonet was known to wet the bed quite frequently as well. Her statement to detectives was that often when she would come in in the morning, that Patsy would have already stripped the bed, 
placing the sheets in the washer. And then when the housekeeper would get there, you know, she'd transfer them to the dryer, sheets are dried, and then apply them back to the bed. And this was at times a daily routine. I believe her statement was that this was a daily routine leading up to about 30 or 40 days before the murder. And it had just kind of gone away. It was almost like John Bonet had uh, grown up from that, that she was no longer wetting the bed. I might be mistaken, but I think at one point she was not wetting the bed and then she started wetting the bed again. That's exactly right. That's right. the same thing that I heard. And I believe that was the statement from the housekeeper. The detectives also found pull-ups, you know, like the, they're, they're not quite diapers. They're for older children. Yeah. I wear them. <laughs> I, I wear them to concerts so I don't have to take a break to go to the bathroom. I don't want to miss anything. Now, I wear them when I'm in the garage. There were pull-ups found in the home. And there was some question if John Bonet was known to wear these. I'm guessing that she would. I don't see why pull-ups would remain in the house when you have children that are nine and six years old. Just look at the pictures of their house, man. It's a mess. That's true. They, <laughs> it's a hot mess. Yes. One of the, the reason why we point this out here is that one of the big theories that has lasted all these years is that John Bonet wet the bed that night and in, you know, anger, anger in uh, an impulsive reaction, Patsy freaks out and throws the kid across the room or hits her over the head with something. And it's, this all came about because she wet the bed once again. Right. And Patsy had just been through it all, and this was the final straw. She lost it, didn't mean to hurt or kill her child, but that's what she did. And then... It was like potty training abuse. It's it's actually pretty common. Like, the, it, even people that wouldn't, you wouldn't think would hit their kids or be violent towards their kids, they can be, if the kid is not being potty trained correctly or, or is not able to do such right so we have to address this because we do have in the autopsy report from the external examination that there was urine on the clothing mm -hmm. i do want to point this out though we should be clear here that this could have come about at any time it doesn't necessarily mean that she 100 percent wet the bed that night no this could have, she could have, she could have wet herself during an attack. That's extremely common. She could have wet herself after, you know, in death. Yeah. So to point to that and say, Hey, she had to have wet the bed. And this is the only, this is the explanation we've come up with due to that fact. Again, I think that's a dangerous assumption to make in this investigation to further this out a little more and you know, I hate to I hate to throw the warning out there that it's going to get a little gross because it seems only sensical because we are discussing an autopsy. But mm, or it, the fact that our show is called True Crime Garage. In in the uh when discussing her wetting the bed, there's mm -hmm. also reports that she has defecated in the bed before multiple times. Mm -hmm. There's also statements that Burke would defecate in John Bonet's bed. Mm. I don't know either one of those to be true. It seems to me like the one that we can really hang our hat on here that seems to be the most true is the bedwetting situation. This is brought up by multiple people. Mm -hmm. And the the other bit, I, I can't say for certain that that I believe either one of those. Now, what would be pointed out during this investigation, and these aren't my words, but bedwetting, defecating in the bed, things of that nature, it was pointed out that sometimes that is what you would see when somebody is being molested. Not only molested, but usually when they're being molested by somebody within the home or within the family. The reason for that is that in those situations, Sometimes the victim will do that consciously or unconsciously, subconsciously, whatever it is, <laughs> mm -hmm. because they want to 
appear less desirable or gross to the perpetrator. It's almost a way of protecting themselves. Yeah. Correct. That I point that out because that is one of the theories as well in this case. I also want to state 100% that there's never been any evidence before or after the murder of John Benet Ramsey that John or Patsy had that they were ever involved in any paraphilia at all. Yeah, because let's be clear on something. They searched their house. I think they actually called it. There was one magazine that called this murder kitty porn murder. And they searched the house for porno and they did not find any. Right. So, and then there's also a, a rumor that they had all these um, books uh, or one of the books on and their study was opened up to incest or something like that. I believe it was that a dictionary. Yeah. That the word incest was marked in a dictionary. I question that one too, Captain, because that's one of those ones that you hear in more salacious reports on this case. Mm -hmm. I really question. I feel like that would be a, a more well-known fact if it was a fact. But we, what we do know as a fact is they didn't find any pornography in the house. Right. And to top that off, these both parents have other children. There's, mm -hmm. you know, there's never been any, any complaints by any of the other children that, that Patsy or John was ever involved in anything like that. Mm -hmm. And to further that out even more, we have Melinda on record multiple times saying her father just wouldn't be capable of such an act and that he be it murder or molestation. Mm -hmm. While we're on the subject though, of the bedwetting situation, one thing that I did find particularly strange in this case and this is well reported too, that John Benet Ramsey had 27 doctor visits in the course of the three years leading up to her death. On an average, that puts her at like nine a year. Mm -hmm. That's a crazy amount. The doctor, when asked about this, states that that was for the, the pediatrician states that these were for all normal reasons. She did have some sinus issues, I guess that would be cause for reoccurring visits. I also wonder too, we know the situation of the accidental time when Burke hit her in the face with the, in the golf face. club yeah, in the face, in the face mm -hmm. That in itself, though, I want to point out just just something like that requires multiple doctor visits. I was looking for like a a, a straight up list. Well, yeah, you'd have if there was stitches, you have stitches, then you have to remove the stitches. Well, we know then that she went to a yeah, we yeah. know that she went to a plastic surgeon. Right. So just like you pointed out there, that that starts with an initial doctor visit, referral to somebody, consultation, the the surgery, a follow up. Right there, you have four out of the twenty seven. Well, and you have a stay at home mom. So I I think yeah, maybe for people that are everybody's working and there's not a lot of money, little things you're just going to let go. But when you have the time to take your daughter in for every little thing and you have the money to cover it, I, I don't think that's unreasonable. External evidence of injury located just below the right ear at the right angle of the mandible, 1.5 inches below the right external auditorial canal is a small rust colored abrasion in the lateral aspect of the left lower eyelid is petechial hemorrhaging. I'm going to skip some portions of this autopsy report, Captain, because there are multiple pages that go through all of these petechial hemorrhaging and right. all the hemorrhaging that takes place. We know that we've already discussed that strangulation was involved, and anybody that's listened to this show or other true crime shows knows that hemorrhaging occurs during those types of situations. But to specifically describe some of the the report here, this part I believe to be important, wrapped around the neck with a double knot in the mid line of the posterior neck is a length of white cord similar to that described as being tied around the right wrist. This ligature cord is cut on the right side of the neck and removed. 
A single black ink mark is placed on the left side of the cut and a double black ink mark on the right side of the cut. Okay, so that portion of that last two sentences of his report are describing the pathologist's actions. Mm -hmm. He's saying, I removed it by cutting it, and then I placed markers indicating where where the cuts took place. The knot is left intact. Extending from the knot on the neck are two tails of the knot, one measuring four inches in length and having a frayed end, and the other measuring 17 inches in length with the end tied in multiple loops around a tan brown wooden stick, which measures 4.5 inches in length. This wooden stick is irregularly broken at both ends, and there are several colors of paint and varnish on the surface. Printed in gold letters on one end of the wooden stick is the word Korea. The tail end of the other word extends from beneath the loops of the cord tied around the stick and is not able to be interpreted. Blonde hair is entwined in the knot and in the cord wrapped around the wooden stick. It appears to be made of white synthetic material. Also secured around the neck is a gold chain with a single charm in the form of a cross. Examination of the right extremities is unremarkable. On the middle finger of the right hand is a yellow metal band. Around the right wrist is a yellow metal identification bracelet with the name John Bonnet on one side and the date 122596 on the other side. This was a gift from her aunt. Mm-hmm. I believe from Patsy's sister. And I mean, just th- there's these little sad, heartbreaking points in this case all along the way that just remind you of the pure innocence of this little girl. And, you know, she, here she is wearing a gift that she just very recently received and was probably very excited to wear this piece of jewelry that she received from her aunt. I mean, it just it, it breaks your heart. I also think it's not clear in this case on how uh, brutal this attack was and that this grot, the way it was set up, it almost looked like you'd put a human on a leash and then you'd be pushing their head down as you pulled the, the grot back. It's truly horrifying. Mm. I don't think that there's any documentary out there that has, I don't know what the right word is here, captain, but I want to say bothered to describe how horrific it would have been, these yeah. injuries are. Mm-hmm. They almost make it sound like it's sleeping beauty lying in a windowless room in the basement. And that's not the situation at all. There, there's a, if anybody that's seen the pictures, read the descriptions and we're going through them here, you hear the, the, the medical speak mm-hmm. jargon. And it just sounds like textbook shit, but really in lay terms, it was, it's a horrific attack on a, on a tiny little person. Yeah. And there's actually two marks on the neck, one at the lower part of the neck. And then at some point that became free and they go in deeper. And there's actually a couple of pictures that you can see how deep the, the rope goes around her throat. It almost disappears. Yeah. Yeah. And the line that it left at the midline of the throat Mm -hmm. after the fact. Yeah. I mean, it's, it looks like somebody took a maroon marker, a maroon Sharpie and just drew a line across somebody's neck. That's how deep it looked like it was. The cord was going into the neck. Mm -hmm. There was a red ink line drawing in the form of a heart that was found located on the palm of John Benet's left hand. The fingernails of both hands are of sufficient length for clipping, and we already discussed that they use the same clippers to clip all of the fingernails. Now, you said that there was no uh, nothing found underneath the nails, but I, I thought there was some DNA and possibly some blood that was found underneath the right hand's finger, fingernails. Showing that showing that she struggled with somebody at some point. You're correct. There are multiple reports on this detail of the investigation. The bit that I gave you was Steve Thomas's report. Mm-hmm. 
one of the leading detectives. So I don't know what is the real true answer. What I find interesting is that he follows up his report by saying, we later learned that the, all the fingernails were clipped with the, using the same clippers. Right. Again, I think that points to his thoroughness of saying, whether this, this is right or wrong, this is what happened. Yeah. Whether it's right or wrong, this is what happened. And then to, to add to the weight of that question, everything, because this also happened. Right. What's the best way to describe the, the, cause there was some, I don't want to use the word damage to the vaginal area. Mm-hmm. I don't think that damage is the right word. Well, would you say indication of, I've actually seen this disputed multiple ways. One claims that there there's evidence that there was at least some kind of touching to the vagina area, digital manipulation. Yeah. At the time of death. And then they also use the word chronic. Now, when you hear the word chronic, you think, oh, well, this is been weeks, going on for months. a long time. No, this was, this term would have made sense to meaning that there was something that happened to her um, days in advance. Uh, one of the medical examiners thought that this would happen. Basically, uh, most likely an individual putting their finger inside of her vagina on the 22nd or the 23rd. Now, other medical examiners have stated that some of this bruising could be due to hygiene. The bedwetting. The irritation of... The irritation, yeah. Of having urine-stained clothing on the skin, right up against the skin for well, and sometimes they get, period of time. You get rashes, and so then a mother would use... Um, they would get some kind of medication to put on the rash, and you could then, you know, that's where you could get some digital, what do they call it? Well, I think to put it pretty as clean as we can would be to say that the reports out there state everything from chronic molestation to something as little as uh, irritated skin that could come from urine stained clothes or right. But let's be clear. Vigorous about wiping. Right. But let's be clear about this chronic molestation this is not there was no signs of there's there's no scar tissues to prove that she was molested for weeks and months and years not true we're talking about the time of her death and probably once a couple days before that's all they prove it also seems like there was wood fragments found in her vagina as well I didn't personally see that in Dr. Meyer's report. Yeah, I think I saw that from Lou Smith. He does reference um, fibers okay. as well. So, again, with this with this area of the body, it's it's really, it's up for de- to debate, really. Mm-hmm. Depending on who you talk to, this represents any number of things. What I feel that I've seen and heard the most, so I'm going to throw this in the batch of general consensus, would be that, just as you pointed out, that this is something that occurred either at the time of death or shortly before, and it could be anything from as terrible as digital manipulation or something uh, more uh, vigorous wiping or hygiene. No, 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 no. I... I'm ruling all that out. What most of the medical examiners state is that the the choking, which people so haphazardly want to say is covering up for for something, right? That the the, the choking of John Monet was is after the fact, and therefore it's covering up an accident. No. The choking was not an accident. It was on purpose. It was not meant to kill her. It was meant for sexual gratification. So if you have A, they believe that there was molestation the time of her death. And I I think that that needs to be fact to me. Because it's like you don't have one or the other. 
And a lot of people think because there wasn't penetration with like a penis that the individual would be um, more likely to be a younger. Or a crazed or disorganized offender. You typically see that right. in those types of, of murder cases. So the report says a one centimeter red purple area of abrasion is located on the right posterior. Sorry, I'm going to struggle with some of these words here, Captain. Posterior lateral area of the one by one centimeter hymenal orifice. The hymen itself is represented by a rim of tissue extending clockwise between the two and 10 o'clock positions. The area of abrasion is present at approximately the seven o'clock position and appears to involve the hymen and distal right lateral vaginal wall. Mm -hmm. We say all that to point out that it, that, that's basically saying there's a small amount of damage or injury to that area. Yeah, bruising. Yeah. One thing that is completely shocking in this whole case, shocking to me, Captain, mm -hmm. is that it appears that Linda Arndt, the pathologist who arrived on the 26th to examine the body at the Ramsey's home, and then several other people as well, that nobody realized that this poor girl had been struck over the head. Yeah. It's, it's almost like it took further detection that it wasn't, you know, you have the shocking scene of the garrote of the cord wrapped around this little girl's throat. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's the shock factor and you, you, you don't see what, what might've been obvious, but all the reports I've read and stop me if you've read any that, that are different, but it sounds as if this head wound, which this, this was a massive injury and we'll get into the details of it, but it sounds like sight seen unnoticed. Right. Yeah. Well, there's no blood. It's not like right. massive pools of blood. Right. And she had long blonde hair. I believe it was, was she in two, two pigtails or ponytails, whatever they call that. Well, yeah, I mean, I, if you've ever seen one of your buddies like hit their head, especially when they have blonde hair, it turns bloody real, real quick. Right. But what I'm getting at is I don't know how much blood there was. There wasn't. Right. And I don't know. I would like to have a pathologist or a doctor sit down with me and tell me the reasons why there's no blood. Obviously, one, she's already dead or near death at the time. Yeah, that's what most medical examiners, when they look at this, say, look, there's a lack of blood, so we they believe. And all, all the credible ones, the most credible ones that I've seen with this case state she was choked. It was sexually, it's for sexual gratification. The perpetrator was choking her, either trying to touch her, now, that would be random. That wouldn't be as much. Most likely, they were touching themselves while they're strangling her. Uh, she There's defensive wounds around her neck, meaning she was trying to stop the choking. At some point, some people believe it would have cut off the blood circulation to her brain. Um, and there's some signs of that. They, they believe through the autopsy. And so... I, I can't remember what they call it, but it's basically where y you're dead. Um, and it's, it, it happens almost instantaneously. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so the, they also believe that, you know, normally if somebody's trying to strangle somebody in order to kill them, there's a lot of marks that are left like inside the neck muscles, there's strains, uh, different bones and stuff possibly could be broken within the neck and none of that is seen here. That's why they believe that these, these bruises within inside the vagina are from molestation because the evidence of the choking doesn't, like I said, it doesn't seem like the purpose of the choking was to kill her. It was to control her. So, where it gets a little convoluted is a lot of medical examiners think that during this sexual 
gratification that the perpetrator then uh, either freaked out or or got into it too much and hit her over the head with something. Now, other people believe that the perpetrator knew that they that she was dead because they also there's also a temporal lobe bruising in the brain and that's common when somebody is when somebody shakes somebody after death right and so somebody chokes her doesn't mean to kill her shakes her she's dead and then i think i believe that's when the the blow to the head happened because at that point the heart has stopped it wouldn't be pumping blood to the to the brain that would be one of the reasons why we wouldn't have pools of blood everywhere that is one reason the other reason could be too is do we how much broken skin do we actually have with this strike right and the the interesting thing here too is the the use of the garrote and the manner that it was used very likely could suggest that it's it's not only a torture device, but it's also a sexual assault device mm-hmm. where you're using it because that's what this, this sicko is into. And sometimes we see this a lot in a lot of cases that we've covered, especially with serials, that they will often choke someone almost to the point of death and then allow them to receive air and then choke them again. Right. And they believe that was happening with her because there there are signs of that for, from the autopsy. But let's, let's be clear that shows like CBS's documentary on this case, it doesn't make any sense. You can't start off with the idea of that there was a, a blow to the head. You cannot start that off. They believe this blow to the head would have made her brain dead. She'd be unconscious, minimum, and then because of the brain swell and the brain bleed, she'd be brain dead. And what happens if you're unconscious or you're brain dead? You do not put up a fight if somebody is choking you. Right. So let's be clear. There's no need to restrain the arms. Right. From the perpetrator's perspective. Right. And I know a lot of people are going to sit there and say, well, but, but all that stuff is to cover up some kind of accident. Let's be clear that CBS and everybody involved in that show were irresponsible for putting out that information. It's just factually not correct. And if you want to, I don't advise that you do this because you might have nightmares about this. But go look up, go look at pictures of John Benet Ramsey's neck and see all those half moons of that six year old girl trying to stop somebody from strangling her. So this idea that there was Burke accidentally hit her on the head, or that or that during uh, changing of uh, pajamas or changing of the sheets or whatever that in, in John Benet's bathroom. Right, that, that that she slipped and hit her head. Or got tossed across the room by her mother or struck over the head with a flashlight. Right. To the credit, I guess, of the of the people that believe Burke may have killed his little sister via an accident or whatever, the skull fracture, to me, does look like it could have came by way of golf club. It, I mean, it, there's... I, if anybody looks at that picture and says, nah, I wouldn't think a golf club could make that. Well, yeah. Cause that strike, I would, I would go, well point. then you're, you, you need to go get glasses, my friend. Right. Because it's straight up in the dimensions. So l- let's describe this because not everybody's going to be fully aware of, of this. The fracture, the skull fracture is huge. It measures eight inches in length. And the way that this works out mm-hmm. is, she would have been struck on the top of her head, but it's more to the right side. The right side of her head, yeah. Yeah. And the the fracture runs from where the where the impact hit on the skull and it runs all the way forward. Yeah. And then what you have at the top where the impact took place, you actually have a full 
section that broke off. It, it runs eight inches in length total, but from where the point of impact, what we have here is picture a skull where you have a crack that runs down the majority of the right side of the skull. Uh-huh. At the top of that crack where it stops, you have a basically a rectangle shaped piece of the skull that fully broke off mm-hmm. on all four sides. And that piece itself is quite small. I believe it's one and a half inches by a half inch. Yeah. But that's that's the rectangle there. And then from there, you have uh, you would have your remaining, so it'd be six and a half inches of a fracture that runs from that broken piece there. Yeah, and and, and cops were looking for this this possibility as well. Maybe not so much a golf club, but... It did look into that uh, Burke had a bat and then they did some tests and then realized they don't believe that would happen through a bat. Not saying that the cops were saying that Burke hit her in the head, but they were looking for objects. Yeah. Uh, then you have a bunch of tests done on the flashlight. Again, I think that's, it's reasonable to, you see, you have a bigger, opening bigger fracture than it goes to a um, thinner fracture so maybe something like a a big flashlight it would definitely have like the weight to it to to be able to do to be able to create that that type of fracture but there's also a picture a crime scene picture that there's this it almost looks like uh one of the like a fireplace tool that would also be like if I were to walk around someone's home after seeing the the skull when the skin is pulled back and see the fracture itself. Uh-huh. If I were to walk around anyone's home and like pick up instruments that I think could have could have made that impact and left that mark right on her, left that fracture in that manner. I don't think I would go for flashlight. I'm not saying it's impossible. I wouldn't go for flashlight. Wouldn't go for bat. Anything that's kind of rounded doesn't seem to make sense to me. I see something where you you need like you need something where you're almost seeing the like that broken piece of the skull is the outline of whatever hit her, and that to me Possibly. would be like a yeah like a fireplace tool or a golf club. Anything like that. Right, but if you look through the crime scene. Well, it's scene, not possibly. It, it's 100%. It has to be, you know, the, the, the markings of what hit her. Yeah, if an object hit her. Um, but, it had to have hit her. Look at the, I mean. Well, let me finish my thought. Sorry. So sorry. first, if you look at the crime scene photos, there there it looks like some kind of fireplace tool. I don't know what you call those. But it's right like under a poker. the poker. Aren't those the poker things that you like? Yeah, but it's, move the wood but around. You know how like some people have like the the pokers, and then they have the brushes, and yeah. then they have the uh, shovels, and and they have all different kinds of things. Okay, right. It looks like there's one, and it's underneath the open window where the suitcase is. And you'd have to go through. There's tons of crime scene photos, but you have to go through. And you can see it laying on the ground. Now, I can't, it's blurry. I can't tell you exactly what it is, but I go, well, we know where the, we know where the paintbrush handle came from. It came from that room. Right. That, that was used in the garage. Uh, we know that at some point she was in that suitcase because we have all these uh, fibers from her clothes that are in that suitcase. So there were going to uh, use well you you can say you know that i won't i won't be on board with that one i'm not not convinced that she was in the suitcase okay but what we do have is a suitcase with a bunch of fibers from the clothes that Correct. she was wearing that night so well again i don't know that they were the clothes that she was wearing that night the well that's the report i that that i saw again but that and i'm not i don't, don't want to sound like i'm challenging you here i'm i'm not disagreeing with you i'm just saying the information i've reviewed doesn't state that same stuff. Right, but right with that suitcase, where that suitcase is? Correct. Underneath that open window, there's a crime scene photo that has some kind of object. And I just want, because police have stated, we haven't found the object of what hit her on the head. Right. And here's where, this is what I question. Okay. It all has to work on some order. Like Lou... Smith, mm-hmm. keep calling him Smith. It's like his 
analysis of the the intruder theory doesn't work. It starts with a stun gun. Well, what does the stun gun do? It incapacitates the person, renders them unconscious at some point, right? So may- very likely too for a small person. We're not talking about a full grown Bro, right. adult. We're talking about a very small child. And how long are they incapacitated for? Th- this is what I would want to know. I I could yeah, I don't think any of us can say because there's differing, you know, there's varying degrees of even these stun guns. But just as analysis it doesn't make any sense because if I go, okay, I'm going to go up to Jamine's bedroom and I'm going to hit her with this stun gun and that's what's going to allow me to take her downstairs. Okay. At what point does she eat pineapple? So, well, we should be clear here for those that don't know, there was um, a substance found in John Bonet upon mm-hmm. the, the autopsy findings that suggests that she ate pineapple or a substance that resembles pineapple shortly before her death. Right. And it then, was undigested. Right. And then we have crime scene photo, photos that have a bowl of pineapple with milk, which I've never heard of. If my mother fed me pineapple, it was just pineapple in a bowl. I don't. That's weird. I've heard of yogurt and cottage cheese, but never milk. I think it's milk. Again, uh, don't don't quote me on that. But <laughs> so, but my thought is, okay, well, Lou Smith, Lou Smith's Smith intruder theory. Have her get downstairs. She wakes up. She's supposed to be met by Santa Claus at some point. She goes downstairs. She sits at the table. She makes herself some pineapple. Maybe she doesn't make herself some pineapple. Maybe Burke made himself some pineapple, but he went to bed. He didn't finish it. So she sits there and decides, well, I'll eat a piece of this. That's when the intruder would have to uh, come in contact with her. Right. Or I guess she could have woke up in the middle of the night Went downstairs, ate some pineapple, went back upstairs. It's possible. Uh, Then you use the stun gun. But again, the stun gun doesn't make any sense because once you start trying to control her with the grot, you need defensive wounds. I I do want to point out here, though, too, the purpose of the grot may not be. Yes, it's control, but not in the manner that I think that some might be thinking. It could be straight up for sexual assault right? type of control. And I'm not going to go into it too much. I mean, uh, maybe on off the record or something, I don't feel comfortable discussing what the garage itself could have been used for. The thing I will put my stamp on here, though, well, before we get into that, let's point out that where the stun gun idea comes into play is that there are pictures. There were, unfortunately... Or fortunately, I guess, depending on how you want to look at it, it's incredibly degrading to the victims involved in this case. But autopsy photos were leaked to the press yeah. at some point, and you can view them online still to this day. Based off of that, we have Lou Smith, who later says, look, you see these two little, what look like little prong marks. He said, "This these came from a stun gun. Now, you have other experts. You have Dr. Warner Spitz, and I'm trying to think of what he's most famous for. He's covered, He's done so many different cases, but Warner Spitz, where our listeners would know him the best from, would be from um, West Memphis 3. He was the one that, that later viewed the photos and said, hey, these marks are bite marks from, a, from turtles. Mm-hmm. So that, that's that dude. He says when he views these photographs... These are not stun gun marks. They're they're he would expect what he's looking for is a stun gun basically is leaving an electrical burn type mark on the skin. Yeah, I And I, he says that what he's seeing doesn't does not appear to be a burn to him. I don't see that on her back, the marks on their back that a lot of people think are like maybe a train track set um which would have been in the room that she possibly was molested in that's the other thing too she has multiple scrapes and stuff on her back and marks on her arms and stuff like that basically that she was squirming during the time that she's molested 
And so could she got these marks on her back at that point? Yes. But the marks on her face, to me, I see what looks like a burn between the two marks. And you would expect a good deal of struggle and squirming if, in fact, she was being choked and there was some type of sexual assault prior to death. Yeah. This is what I said I was going to put my stamp on here, Captain. Reviewing the pictures of the skull, I don't know science. I'm not a pathologist. I'm not claiming to be an expert. You take this for whatever you, for what it is. It's it's some dumb guy in a garage giving his opinion. Wait, but, no, I should, I should go then. <laughs> should be my turn then. But what my opinion is based off of these photographs, mm-hmm. the damage to the skull, man, I don't think that Burke would have had the strength, regardless of weapon, to create this type of damage in one single blow. This looks to me to be one single solid hit to the skull. Mm -hmm. I also will go further and say, I don't think, and I've seen pictures of John Bonet's bathroom. Mm -hmm. The theory that Patsy lost control and threw her across the room. And this was some kind of head injury that occurred when she got thrown across the room or she hit her head on something after being, slapped by patsy i'm not saying that patsy's innocent what i'm saying is this injury did not come from anything like that in my opinion this is a single strike a very violent strike to the head single strike with with a lot of strength behind it and a lot of force behind it the other thing i will say too i beg anyone to go out there and look up the garot or what they are calling a garrote in this case. Because what I see here, this is one of those rare times in the case where you see some level of criminal sophistication. And what I mean by that is this this weapon, this torture device here, mm-hmm. appears to me, this wasn't the first time, whoever constructed this, this was not the first time that they put one of these things together. Well, most medical examiners call these not sophisticated. Yeah. These, yeah. these are not these aren't knots made by a nine-year-old. When I look at this, what I see, if you, I would love if somebody would take the pictures, like if I could go back and unsee them and somebody could take away the words, John Benet Ramsey from the photographs Uh and just hand them to me and go, Oh, what's that? What's this from? What do you think this is? What I see there, captain, without anything clouding my vision is an intricate torture device constructed for the sole purpose of sexual assault. Yeah, and it seems like most of the medical experts believe, again, during this sexual assault, during this torture, that this individual lost control and ended up hitting her on the head. But at that point, the brain wasn't pumped, the heart wasn't pumping to the brain already. Mm -hmm. Like, that's a real thing, I guess, during strangulation that that will stop first and it slows it along the way yeah and it's still the person's still alive technically but there's no blood or oxygen pumping to the brain now meaning she'd be brain dead they hit her on the head because they lost control or it was part of their fantasy or whatever i think that's a very good possibility but like i said we have fibers whether you want whether you want to believe this or not, because there's experts that contradict each other over and over, but there's fibers in that suitcase. And my thought is that this individual, for whatever reason, the sexual gratification was going to be better for them. uh, If they molested her inside the house, knowing that her family was there, there was excitement there. Once they figured out she's dead, that wasn't part of the plan. The ransom notes already sitting on the staircase, right? Mm -hmm. I have to get her out of here. I am going to use the suitcase to transport her. I put her in the suitcase. At this point, no blow to the head. I think it's possible that an individual put her in that suitcase and tried to lift her up through that window and then dropped her. 
and landing on her head. Yes, yes, their suitcase would hit first, but she's inside the suitcase. And I think that's possibly what created um, that fracture. You pointed out something that's very important in this case. And just with every aspect of this case, there's so many different opinions. There's so many different, even expert opinions. And regarding the autopsy itself, cause of death, injuries to John Bonet, how those injuries occurred, we've had many very reputable, good, solid experts over the years examine this case. But what they've examined have been photographs, and what they've examined have been documents. There's only been one pathologist to examine the body, right. and that was Dr. Myers, MD, in 1996. For all of our old episodes, check us out exclusively on the Stitcher app. And we have a weekly show on Stitcher Premium called Off the Record. Cheers to you, Captain. And thanks to everybody out there for listening. Thank you for telling a friend. And thank you for all of the wonderful five-star reviews. Please join us back here in the garage next week for episode five. Until then, be good, be kind, and don't let us.